Good afternoon. Is this working? Can you hear me? All right. Okay, good. Uh, so, welcome. Um, I think we have some guests today. I, I know we have at least one. Yes. Want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is uh, Sheree Hedayat. I'm a friend of Canada Sophie's and uh, considering joining the program here, so I thought I'd come in and spend the day. Today, we're going to do a couple things. Um, we have the cases um, uh, that I asked you to read to talk about, but we're also going to reserve some time to talk about sort of um, sort of where we go from here in terms of the, the rest of the class. Let, let me say a little bit about that uh, to begin with. Um, we, uh, so we're 12 weeks into this, right? 12 weeks ago, I think is when we uh, first began this journey together uh, on learning leadership, organizing, and action. Um, and the first half was very much focused, as you recall, on uh, the five different practices and sort of defining projects and uh, the structuring leadership teams and so forth. And then the second half, after we came back from, um, from break and after the midterm, has been focused more on integrating the practices and on, it's a whole sort of part two. Remember the piece by Connie Gersick about timing and projects and the way that there's sort of a beginning and then there's a, a midterm, a sort of a middle moment when things get reorganized, usually. And then there's an end game. Uh, it's kind of distinct temporal periods. In between those periods, it's kind of hard to change too much, but in those periods, you can change a lot. And so. We're sort of moving now from that, we're sort of moving now to the end game period, which we call the end game period. So it's, it's another kind of little shift in terms of how, how things work temporarily. Uh, that uh, uh, work of hers is really, really interesting. It's, it's one of the few pieces of work that's really been done understanding time and organization and how they work in relationship uh, to each other. So since we came back after halfway, midterm, so forth, evaluations, uh, the first a week back, we looked at um, integrating practices. That was that section on, on uh, dilemmas and paradoxes in organizations and the tension between organizations and, and change and, and, and so forth. But then we began, um, uh, in, in the second week back, we, we began our case discussions. That was when we did orange hats, was the, was the discussion, the main discussion we had. But then in section, the focus was on campaign planning. Uh, sort of okay. So now, as we move toward the second, you know, moving into the second half of all this, let's focus in on end game can or the end result campaign planning. That's what we worked on in this section. Uh, then last week, uh, we continued on case discussions um, again um, about the negotiations and the schools. But then in section and beginning in here, we also focused on overcoming barriers on on the various kinds of of the fears that, that inhibit us, that hold us back 
in terms of doing this kind of work. Uh, and did that also in section. And I just want to say we had, um, um, there's 11 papers we're, we're, we're going to share. Um, uh, this week was, uh, last week's papers were about the best we've seen. I mean, uh, it was depth and uh, depth, honesty, clarity, uh, and real understanding. I just want to, uh, let's see, papers by Mary, Lydia, Juliana, Maggie, Sam, Sharanya, um, <coughs> Ellen, Raquel, Eric, Julia, and Roman. Um, so good work. But, yeah. <laughs> so now we're the fourth week back, which is also, you know, there's next week and the week after, and it's over. Okay? So this is kind of where we are right now. So this week, uh, we're going to uh, also have case discussion here, but then we want to focus more on what's involved in drawing the campaign to a conclusion, uh, because that's sort of, that's where we're focused now, in terms of um, how to, uh, what kind of, what, what leadership challenge does that present with respect to teams that you're working with? How do, how do you engage that? Uh, what about these events, you know, these, these events that are happening or, or going to happen or may happen or may be intended to happen, how to deal with that? And then finally, how to think about what comes next, uh, like after whatever the peak is, uh, what, what occurs then. So we're going to begin discussion of that here a little bit later, and then in section we'll continue that kind of focus. Next week, um, um, our focus shifts from integration to um, the craft of organizing, and sort of focusing back on the individual, what it takes to be a good organizer, what that's all about. And that paper is required. That's a required response paper. Um, and next week will also be your last section week, OK? So just to put this some kind of shock in here. But yes, so yeah, next week's the last section meeting. And so it's going to be important to devote time in that section meeting to evaluation, to some celebration, to uh, thinking about follow-up and so forth uh, next week. Uh, then the last week, um, which is week after next, we'll have two classes here. We won't have section that way. We have two classes here. And one, the first one's on organizing in the big picture. Sort of thinking about what does all this mean in terms of changing the world, but also what does it mean in terms of pathways and projects that aren't, quote, officially organizing, but that people here are going to be doing, and what's the use uh, of these skills and, and so forth that we've been that we've been working on, and then our last meeting here will be uh, sort of a wrap up evaluation. What do we learn from all this kind of thing? Uh, now, uh, there's a couple more things that go with our wrap up here. Uh, Abel, you want to say about the reflection book? Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 We're putting together a reflection book about uh, everything that's happened over the course of the semester. A lot of the reflections, quotes that uh, made us think about our own leadership and grow. And we want to have that so that everyone can have access to it uh, after the class is over and so that you can look back in, it, at, in the celebration and the stuff that we've done together with, uh, with Joy. So what we want to do is break it down into a couple of parts. We want um, everybody's picture, maybe just like a headshot, uh, something where you're, you're visible. And also um, a, a paragraph or a couple of lines about uh, thoughts that you have about the class and, and what you've um, experienced being here. So what we'll do is we'll have this section. We'll, um, this week we'll send out a Google Doc or something like that so you can send in some of the quotes. And then the following week we'll ask you to send in the pictures. And then we'll all take a group shot, uh, a group photo with our TFs in section next week. Uh, does, that sound, does that sound good? Uh, can, I, can I see a show of hands if you're with me? Are you with us? <laughs> All right, good. All right, we got the ask. <laughs> Thanks. It's great. Um, and, uh, and then there's a question of the celebration uh, for this class. Rohan? Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, so uh, we're really excited.
decided we're putting together a celebration to celebrate the wonderful work that everyone has put in over the course of the semester. Um, yesterday, you all got an email with three dates and times, and we're trying to gauge what the best time would be for most people to be able to make it to our celebration party. So we're just going to do a quick show of hands, and I'm going to read out the date. Raise your hand if you cannot make it to these dates. So the first date is April 28th from 6 to 7.30. Is there anyone who absolutely cannot make it? What day of the week is that? It's a Monday. Six to 7.30. Okay. The second one is Thursday, May 1st. This is immediately after our last class from 2.45 to 4.15 p.m. And last, Monday, May 5th, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Okay. Very well. So we're going to send out an email again to confirm our date and place. And uh, we're looking forward to celebrating with all of you guys. Thank you. And then, the, the most exciting of all, we have a final paper. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's due on May 9th. Uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, it emailed to your teaching fellow. Uh, it's seven pages, um, and uh, we'll we'll discuss it in more detail coming up. Uh, but basically, it's an extended version of uh, you know the question of my own learning, uh, the concept concepts here in my project, and you know sort of like what did I learn from all this. And um, generally, on, on final papers, I think the more that you decide to use the final paper to grapple with something that you're trying to figure out, the better paper it's likely to be. The more you think, oh, this is, my, this is how I show off what I know, that's the lousy paper. It's not going to be very good. Uh, because that's not what the point is. Uh, the point is to use it as a, as a learning exercise, engage with it, make it work for you as a kind of an opportunity to tie this whole thing together and what your real takeaways are from it. And so we'll, we'll have a handout on that um, uh, uh, next, next week. So that's kind of where, so that's where we are right now. And we just want to sort of shift our focus and time frame. So we're going to come back and talk a little more about that. But first, let's get into these cases, um, this third round of cases that we ask you to read that are um, sort of mythical. I mean. Um, Caesar and the farm workers, Gandhi in India, Sam Adams, you know, the organizer, not the beer. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but they're also, they all involve local organizing as part of broader campaigns. Um, they were all episodes in much larger, longer, much grander movements. And they all um, drew on the cultural and the economic and the political in terms of the way in which they operated. So there are certain kind of themes that cut across them all. But let's start with that first one on the, um, the American Revolution um, and Sam Adams. Um, so uh, I'm going to, again, throw this out. What, what did you see? In, see, I guess the thing is here, the practices that we've been working on, uh, the question is, what do you see about those practices in action in this case? Which we sort of think of as, you know, as historical or the Tea Party people run around and claim the Tea Party and, you know, that sort of thing. But there's actual work that went on to make these events happen. They're not just mythic occurrences. And they're not just some magic personality that enchanted everybody and then everything just sort of happened. It's not how it works at all. It's hard work. And, and it involves so many of the tools that we've been working on. And so I wanted to sort of give you an opportunity to sort of look with the eyes from your experience with this class into these events and see what you see there. So let's just start there with Sam Adams and his organizing drive, which you know began here in Boston. What do you take from that? Usual silence. Yes? Um, I guess kind of going back to the very, very beginning of the class, just sort of thinking about like a sense of urgency. Yeah. Um, I mean, that comes up pretty early in this particular case, just in terms of the they had no choice, in terms of how to respond to the parliament, sort of attacks 
what they were going to be imagining, but just kind of being faced with that, like, you know, do or die, sort of, you know, yay or nay, or, you know, this or that kind of choice um, seems to be the emphasis for, like, what they, what they were doing. Did you give a sense of to what extent that sense of do or die was just sort of out there, or the extent to which people like Adams and others uh, promoted it? Um, I mean, it definitely talks about how like not everyone was on the same page in terms yeah. of like, what Boston was doing. So, I mean, it definitely seems like there's a lot of massaging of sort of the different relevant facts and sort of people framing things in yeah. some way to yeah. get people to see that hey, if it starts here, you know, it'll you know, potentially spread out. Um, but yeah, just kind of dealing with like having sort of having a sense of urgency, but also sort of getting other people to see it. Yeah. So, story, so it's sort of best, I guess. Um, definitely seems to, to be the Yeah, because did you get a sense of how the leadership was organized during this period? Of, of how they structured themselves, the leadership of this uh, effort that became the American Revolution? Did you see the organization that was involved? There was an organization. Yeah? Yeah? I, didn't, I have a question about that. There was like a committee in each city, right? The committees of correspondence. A little bit later came committees, of course. But okay. Are these the large committees, or are they like 10 or 5 people? I, I, I didn't uh, know moderate size. The committee of correspondence was sort of a bit broader. Okay. But, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe 20, 30, but reaching out broader. But the first group was uh, Adam's organization, Sons of Liberty. I mean, this was an organization. This, this was a, a, a leadership team uh, in each of these towns, in Charleston and in... Uh, New York and in Boston and uh, where else on the coast? Um, they were mostly coastal. Charleston? Yeah, I said that. And because that's sort of where there was the most, um, you know, uh, commercial activity and so forth. And so they had their organization that was out there beginning to shape events and beginning to interpret what was happening in such a way that, that it could, that they could mobilize the public into support for their vision of independence which wasn't everybody's <laughs> vision by a long shot. So I think it's just, it's not like all of a sudden everybody in these colonies said, oh, let's separate from Britain. Uh, they were English. They thought of themselves as Englishmen. Uh, a lot of their claims were made in terms of the rights of Englishmen, is how they put it. And so the, the independence thing was not like a broad thing to begin with, but there, there was a group of people working at it. What else did you see here? Pretty interesting what they pull out. I mean, they were fairly successful. Yes. Well, as you see here, what about their tactics? What about how they developed their campaign? Yeah, Eric. It, I guess this is kind of tied into doing what you were saying. It seems like there was this real step by step process of polarization, almost where like yeah. people were identified and you know like and, and were forced kind of one way or the other until there were these two sides. Even though even in yeah. It's interesting because they, here, especially in New England, they, they seem to have a sense of, of how far to push the polarization and when. Um, it's, it, it, yeah, it's interesting because it seems like they take a move like tea boycott and then there's a or tea tax and then there's a protest, then there's a reaction from Britain. It's a little slow because they're going back and forth in boats. They don't have the internet yet. And so, and then there's a counter response, and then a counter response, and it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of um, reaction from Parliament that really helped people like Adams uh, polarize things, because they kept responding with more aggressive measures, and so then they'd say, see, it's inevitable, and then they'd go to their next move, and so it was a very interesting back and forth that they went through in, in this period. Yeah, there was... Somebody over here? I thought I saw somebody. No. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, I think they uh, did a good job with the moral jujitsu side of it, too, because, you know, I, th I think he says in the article that at the beginning, you know, most people didn't actually approve of the Boston Tea Party. It was like a pretty extreme action to, like, throw 90,000 pounds of tea away. But when Britain's response, was to crack down really hard on the colonies, that actually had the, the opposite effect of what they intended. And where instead of just like punishing people into obedience, it unified the colonists behind the yeah. Tea Party people. 
And did you see their, their intentionality about that? I mean, you have a mass meeting, then you have an action. I mean, it's kind of like they're, they're always balancing the actions with some form of reaching out to everybody and sort of engaging in them. It's really interesting, the, you know, the mass, the mass meetings and then the actions, mass meetings and the actions. And did you, did you notice some of the tactics besides dumping tea in the harbor? What were some of the other tactics that they used? Because they did some mass organizing tactics, too. Yeah? Whenever there was a threat of division within their group, they would call a mass meeting and put things to a vote. Yeah. They used mass meetings really, really skillfully. What else did they do? Did you notice fast days, days of fasting? You know, you talk about within a faith tradition which in, with, within which they were operating. It's a call to sacrifice. This is not going to be easy. This is like, you know, another, another way to build power through culture and through cultural participation. Solemn League and Covenant. I know what that was. I think we need to do a little more reading on this one. Solemn League and Covenant. What was that? Yeah. Yeah, Mick. <laughs> so, um, a bunch of merchants wanted to keep trading with the UK, um, despite, and that would have been a real threat to unity in the group. So they made uh, all the people try and sign on to this thing. It's essentially like a boycott of the UK, right? Yeah. And then some people didn't sign it, and then they ended up being ostracized as a little group because they called the vote and got hundreds and hundreds of people on board. Yeah. They were then the ostracized minority. So they're doing lots of reaching out and mobilizing. The League and Covenant, I just like them. It was, they were getting merchants and individuals to sign on and agree to boycott uh, British goods. And it wasn't just tea. It was much broader than that. It was interesting. They call it a League, which is like out of the civic tradition. And they were calling it a Covenant, which is out of their faith tradition. And so it sort of had a double whammy, just like Dr. King's talk about American justice and uh, the, how does he put it, God's justice and America's ju American justice. Uh, when he's talking, on the, he's evoking both cultural uh, narratives, which is what they're doing uh, here as well. What else uh, did anybody draw from this? Because they move progressively through different forms of organization. They start with the Sons of Liberty. Then they moved to the committees of correspondence. And so it's sort of like broadening out. Sons of Liberty was like, that was a pretty, you know, uh, not everybody knew who was in that, right? That was sort of a much more closely held kind of secret type group. Committees of correspondence were much more uh, open. Uh, they were corresponding from city to city. That's like, again, they managed to communicate without the internet, which is remarkable. Um, but then they progressively moved to a new form of organization, uh, which the story, story kind of culminate, culminates with. Anybody pick up on that? Is that yeah, the Continental that. Congress? Yeah, what was the significance of the Continental Congress? Um, that they were bringing together everybody in a way where then they were able to really think about what would creating their own future look. Were they a protest group anymore at that point? At that point, I wouldn't think they start creating. <laughs> they start creating their own their own instruments for self governance. Yeah. They actually form. They actually create uh, uh, entities of independence. I mean, so they're moving from this this Sons of Liberty group, and then they're getting broader. They're more of social movement. Then they say, okay, the time now is we're going to actually claim authority. We're going to start claiming the authority. And that's what the Continental Congress represents. It's a usurpation of British authority and a claim to it, saying, no, no, ours, not yours. And, you know, Declaration of Independence and all that sort of comes from, from uh, eventually from that period. Now, I know this is sort of an unconventional take on American history. Uh, it ought to be, I think, more of the general understanding of American history because really the country was born in an organizing project, you know, of Sam, Sam Adams and his people and others in Philadelphia and other, 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 other places. Um, one interesting thing, and, and if you think about their tactics, mass meetings, marches, pledges, rallies, public rituals, all sorts of tactics that you can see in that list of tactics that Gene Sharp put together of nonviolent tactics. 
And that's kind of the, the, the one more point that, that I want to make is that um, in New England, the, uh, it was virtually nonviolent, the whole thing. Uh, once declaration, once independence was declared, and once the, um, they marched out to Concord, you know, and had the showdown in Lexington and Concord, because there was a, uh, an arsenal, uh, they thought, of uh, weaponry out there. And then the British lost out, marched back. They were isolated in Boston, which was a peninsula, and then eventually they left. <coughs> Once after that, there really was no more fighting in New England. It was all in New York and the central states and in the south. Why do you think that might have been? Why do you think it might have been? Yeah. Why do you think? What, what do you think it was about New England? Uh, anybody have any thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, I think maybe part of it has to do with the fact that like it became the space of support because there were so many ways for ordinary people to kind of participate, um, and that I think that's you know a key aspect to a lot of the, the nonviolent struggle that we've read about and making yeah like making finding different avenues for people to participate depending on where they're coming from. So you know certain opportunities for merchants specifically. Yeah, they really did an amazing organizing job when you really uh, think about it, you know, uh, yeah, in that period. Yeah? They didn't have to also answer to Parliament. They, you know, the colonies after, they didn't have to really after they broke away and started to set up their own, more or less. I guess the question is, what? No, I, yeah, but I guess the question is, why were they, why did that happen here? And I know we haven't taken this in American history class, but. Uh, what happened here and not, not in New York and not in the South? Yeah. Well, just through colonial American history, New England always had this shared tradition of the meeting houses and the town hall meetings. So there was already an understanding that the, once the infrastructure was there and the yeah. idea of you called a meeting, everybody was expected to participate. So it, they always had the groundwork laid. People yeah. didn't have to start from scratch. And I mean, despite that, it's still really impressive. Like when they talk about 5,000 people coming up to the meeting, like yeah. you have to think about how many people yeah. were there. That's like a huge percentage, yeah, yeah. So it's not to take away from what they did, but it explains a little bit of what they were working with and how they, they weren't exactly starting from ground zero. There's some common language and common understanding of obligations. Of citizens. Yeah, no, it's very important. Common understanding and also practices. Because the way land was given in New England, it was given to these, um, like the Massachusetts uh, colony, which then uh, gave land to townships, which then gave it uh, out to individuals. So Massachusetts, for example, was settled by township, not by individual family, not by direct property grants from the crown. In the South, grants were made by the king to wealthy property owners. And so from the very get-go, the South had a very different setup. New England was, was, was colonized in a way that it fostered uh, local self-government uh, and invested. That's why there's all these towns around Boston here there aren't, uh, they, they're suburbs now, but they, they've been around, you know, since 16 or whatever. It's because they weren't formed as suburbs. They were formed, that was how the colony was settled. So there was already this practice of self-governance. And, and I think, and so they were building on that and then organizing on that as the basis for their breakaway from, from England. Anyway, it's just an interesting sort of perspective on the conditions that make for organizing, that facilitate organizing, and so forth. But let's go on. Um, how do we do on Gandhi? Did, uh, how was the reading on Gandhi and his salt march? Yeah, we were, uh, we were sort of having a Quaker session. <laughs> yeah. What, what about Gandhi and his story? You know? I mean, what they have in common with the Brits, is, with, the, with the Americans, is that they, the British were their problem. <laughs> Um, a lot of the world has that in common, uh, or had that common, in common. But what, what about, where did you see the organizing in, in what he was up to in this, in this account? Yeah, Sushi. I mean, the obvious is that he made this 24-day, very public walk, like he said, and he
Why do you think he, he, he did it in the form of a march? And why do you think he chose salt? Yeah. Um, I think perhaps partly because it allowed opportunities for a lot of anywhere could be picking up salt, making salt, selling salt, um, or joining the march. So people could participate just a little bit or could actually join and get more involved intensely for longer periods of time. Yeah, and did, did you get the sense that was accidental? Mm -hmm. I mean, media strategy, was there a media strategy? Yeah, you bet there was a media strategy. I mean, this was like, like again, you know, uh, Gandhi's a very strategic guy. Uh, was a very strategic, and so nothing happened that wasn't with intention and with with you know thought through and with some theory of change involved. So what, what would you say his theory of change here was? What, what would you say was guiding him as a theory of change in this in this particular context? What was he going to do here? What was he trying to make happen here? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. But why did he do it in this way? In other words, what was the theory the behind? Yeah. The because it was very important for the people because of the, the, the temperature and for the way they needed to have salt. So salt really mattered the yes. way the way buses mattered in Montgomery, Alabama. I mean, salt was not some abstraction. No. No, and I think that's a good point. And why else? Yeah. Um, like he knew that he would get a strong response from, from the British and the tactics were nonviolent and the British responded, you know, violently, then that would sort of set the stage so the internationals to sort of also put pressure on them um, to allow them to be well, not, well to pressure them to, to give them an So on the one hand, if the British react, right, then that helps because it tells the world the reality that's hidden when the British don't act, right? But then, what else was going on there? Yeah, Nima? Uh, he almost was first led into the viceroy, even when he made the threat, or when he said that he was going to do this. Not a threat, just information. Just information. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It, it was so small that they were perplexed as to what this would mean, yeah. and nobody had expected it to snowball into something this large. And I think that is what he had actually come to own, maybe, yeah. because had he been arrested then, this whole movement would have stopped right there. So uh, he, he was not arrested. He chose something as simple as salt, which could be reproduced by people everywhere on roofs of housetops. Yeah. And, uh, and it was a simple act. I and mean, because Gandhiji did it, there was such a, a, a big movement in the country because everybody was watching him at yeah. that time. They were waiting for an assault on him. Had, had, had the uh, uh, government just arrested him, or the viceroy just arrested him, it wouldn't have happened. That message wouldn't have reached. It wouldn't have been so potent. It's interesting to, to, to think about. Because on the other hand, I mean, if, if why try to get everybody to make, to make their own salt? What, what was the point of coming up with, with that tactic? What, why that? I mean, with tea, you understood there was a tax on the tea and the British. What, what was the salt thing? Yeah. Well, it kind of makes me think of the analogy to the bus boycott. Like there's kind of an element of sacrifice like, yeah. by the people where if you're doing something that's more out of the way, that's costing you a little bit in the time, there's more investment. More and what else? Yeah. It encourages self reliance. So yeah. if he's going for the big goal of self government. Yeah. Um, self-reliance over this small everyday act of using salt can then maybe lead to this larger change. What What is it beyond, yeah, Eric? Well, and it was also, I mean, it was breaking the law. It was yeah. supposed to buy the, the salt directly from the state for the state monopoly. So I mean, I guess it was a, a small way to break the law, but in aggregate, it ended up, I think they said actually, I mean, having a significant economic effect on the British. Uh, there there was the economic effect, certainly, because there was a tax, uh, uh, all that attached to it. But think about the effect of getting a whole country to say, your law doesn't apply to me. And you get a whole country to do that. What happens? You know, it, it reminds, well, it just reminds me that, that morning that Dr. King uh, is looking 
to see if there's any black faces on the bus, and there are none. And it's sort of like a shift. Wait a second. Wait a second. Who's got the power here? I mean, very, very interesting, because this was a real shift that came out of this marks. This was one of the things that accomplished. And so again, it's this idea of coming up with tactics that lots of people can be part of, as opposed to you know a few people, because then that's what really builds the power. It's what shifts the power ground, and it shifts the ground, and, uh, and and moves the whole thing in a different way. Yeah, Pat, or no, uh, Dimitri. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say that salt wasn't very simple. It was actually very powerful in the sense that yeah. it was easier for them to get independence from the British from something they could have access to, yeah. and they were being told that they shouldn't take it. That's and they right. were just there in the face to take yeah. it from there. Perfect. Yeah, because then it's in front of you, and you're saying, no, no, no. Wait a second. What about yes? Oh. Oh, guess what? We all did it. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, again, when things hide in plain view, the, the simplicity of the tactics we're reading about. These are not super complex. T is not complicated. Salt is not that complicated, but very powerful, as the music says. And, and the march, it builds its own dynamic. You know? It's sort of a, a campaign in action. Uh, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen when he reaches the sea? What's, there's a narrative that's unfolding in the way the strategy unfolds that invites people into it. Yeah, Kevin. I think the salt thing is also quite important for the moral of a uh, campaign. Because it, it seems almost silly to beat somebody up for them making salt, right? And so I think nonviolence is perfectly aligned with having something as arbitrary as it's the British law of the yeah. salt. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So uh, you can begin to see some common threads between the American colonists and Gandhi, um, or the bus boycott, for that matter. I mean, these were all you know, actions by people to free themselves in one way or another. They were all rooted in certain kinds of simple tactics, but lots of people participated. And, and so now what about the, the farm workers? We have to go to the farm workers now. What about that? Of course, you all saw the great Chavez movie that, um, no, I didn't have an issue with the movie. But, uh, no, and actually, in the movie, they had some of these events, even though they were a little misconstrued, but that's another story. Um, no, what, what did you, uh, what do you see? I mean, from the themes we've been looking at, the, the things we've looked at, what do you see here in this one? And this is, you know, right here. I mean, not here, it's uh, California, it's the uh, U.S. It's not that long ago. Yeah, Eric. Well, I think the first thing that jumped out for me is um, just a running theme is just the essence of and I think with a lot of these stories and having a movie about someone, right, you hold them up as like the singular person who did everything as a superhero. And just the way the book is written, all these different interviews, all these different stories that, that really was so many people um, working, working, disagreeing, debating, but the pain is tough. Yeah, it's interesting. This 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 book is really it's a, it's really oral history. It's really Jacques Levy interviewing Caesar and other people in real time, sort of when this stuff was going on. And so it's not like somebody going back and you know going through the archives and stuff. It's kind of interesting that way. What what else did you see in this? What what puzzled you about it, or what? Yeah, what did you see in it? What was going on? Why did they choose the tactics they choose? They chose. What was the theory of change behind it? Same questions that we've been asking you to ask yourselves. Who are my people? What's the theory of change? What's the problem? How to devise tactics? What kinds of resources? Where's the power? What do you see in this? Pat? At one stage, I like when he brought in the Monsignor to help the people with the trust, because there, there is so, so much going on that people that they didn't trust. And then he said, OK, let's be, bring the priest in, the Monsignor, who the people would have the trust and would believe. Is it that was that in the, you mean in, in the fast, during the fast, or? Yeah, I think this is, he brought in where he said he was going to ask the priest to come in and help the people could. That's right. I wonder if that is it. I was speaking to so many of them. No, 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 I, I, mean, I, mean, saying, I mean, certainly the religious, uh, 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 the faith was a core dimension of this movement, just as it was of of Gandhi's and just as it was of the uh, civil rights movement, in other ways. I mean, 
So there's, I mean, that underpinning is very, very profound here. And a lot of tactics come out of that. Yeah, Nada? Yeah, I think on that note, it's, it's interesting to compare the role of the fast and the, um, in the great boycott with, um, with the collection of salt and kind of this moral authority angle. Because yeah. I think that your different tactics address different audiences. So I think in the case of Gandhi, in the letter to the Viceroy, he talked about like the suffering people will endure will like melt the stoniest hearts. And yeah. I think, you know, when you see these protesters getting beaten for salt, like that's a really powerful message to the British. Yeah. But the way I understood in the case of um, Cesar Chavez, like he, part of the reason why he undertook the fast was to send a message to the people within the movement who were getting really, you know, anxious and really like to, to keep people to uphold this commitment to nonviolence because there was some, you know, poverty that was starting to be damaged. Yeah. To really like speak to kind of within your movement. Yeah. You know, this is the degree I'm willing to, to sacrifice for myself and that this is why we need to like hold fast to nonviolence. So it's interesting that what you can use similar tactics, but different to, in, in different directions. No, it's interesting. Now, they both though involve sacrifice, don't they? Uh, they both involve the power of sacrifice and sort of the, I think that the, at the end of the day, I think we realize that nothing comes for free, you know, and, and that any good, there's going to be some cost attached to it. And the question is sort of to go to that rather than run away from it. Because um, certainly Caesar's Fast was, I mean, it, it was initially focused within, but it became focused without very, very quickly. Um, and so it was sort of doing both, both pieces of work. Did you notice the difference between a fast and a hunger strike? Because they didn't call it a hunger strike. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And there was somebody there that said that they were going to hunger strike to pressure him to stop doing that. <laughs> right, right. And I thought that was a neat distinction because the fast was more for himself. Whereas the hunger strike was trying to pressure somebody else to do something. Well, think about was the fast for himself? Well, I thought it was also to like gain the attention of outsiders or to show his own personal determination for this, and also that helped others realize too about what why it was so important for yeah. him, but also why it was so important for them. Whereas the hunger strike was more so trying to put pressure on someone else by external means. So yeah. I thought. I mean, he was really, like, he anticipated that, too, right? That that might be a tactic that yeah. his own people would try to get some him to do. So I thought making that very clear to them and kind of, like, stopping them immediately was another interesting thing. Yeah, well, it, and it's interesting, though, what, how he did leverage it. Was there, back there, did you? Oh, I'm just, I think, to say that the, the concept of fast has, would resonate with the Catholic population. There's a, a, a hunger strike is a political action. Yeah. A fast is Yeah, so see. Sin yeah, it's really a great point. It's not instrumental in the same way, and 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 he always he made the distinction, really learning from Gandhi, who never did hunger strikes either, that it's not about extorting an action from your opponent, but what it is is about challenging your supporters. <laughs> it's challenging your own people to step up and take responsibility for the kind of discipline and sacrifice involved in building a movement or in, or in achieving change. And so it has a very different, different focus. Because uh, uh, my job on the FAST was to go around and explain it to farm worker um, communities around California. And you know, I got them say, well, you know, Susan's been on an ayuno. Everybody said, well, what? we need them strong. You, you know, tell them to keep eating. And you say, no, no, what's this all about? There would then be this reflection, and we'll, well, no, well, we want to send a delegation and make it eat. No, well, okay, that's not going to work. And so then what can you do? Well, it would turn into ways in which they were going to recommit to picketing the liquor stores or organizing other workers, or it would translate into um, uh, actions of, um, of commitment through action. And that was sort of what that whole thing did. So it, it actually um, empowered the movement enormously, but not through pressure on the opposition, but by mobilizing the resources of the movement, which in turn took the boycott and shut it up to a whole other level. So it's kind of like an indirect, you think of it more as a carom shot, in, like in pool, where it's like, like the direct hit. It's sort of over here, and it came back and did something else over there. It's a very, very interesting tactic. I mean, it's profoundly educational for me, certainly. What else? 
I mean, organizing, basically. I mean, the stuff you read about the, the, um, the, uh, yeah, on the fast, that was what I was doing. Well, on the Mar let's see, did we read about the March to Sacramento? No. Um, yeah, the, the, the organizing, the Jamar, I was, like, coordinating that. The, and then, and then I wound up getting sent on the boycott to, um, to Canada, where I spent a couple of years in Toronto and Montreal, stopping Canadians from eating California grapes, <coughs> which was very interesting. I learned about a lot of stuff. So during this period, I was both doing the organ, I was involved in the organizing and the boycott work in different, in different, different roles. And it was an amazing school. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it was, tremendously uh, valuable school for learning, you know, learning this stuff, yeah. Um, I had a question just about both Gandhi and Chavez um, when they, Fasting to kind of mobilize the resources within the organization. That seems to me like a question of timing, also, about where you stand. I don't know if I'm not sure like what the how the, how do you make that call? Yeah. I'm going to do this until okay. okay, like or when that creates that urgency of like something's going on. How do you respond? To that? Yeah, it's a great uh, if you can figure that out and then <laughs> bottle it or I. No, it's, uh, you know, that, that's kind of where the art comes into this stuff. Because clearly, you know, you could do something like that and it would have no effect. I mean, in other words, like if you don't have support, if you're not, you know, engaged already with other people, people would understand what's going on. Um, yeah, I think the timing is really, uh, it's a really good question. I, I you know, I don't, I don't know. The, I mean, I don't think there's a formula to answer that. I mean, he chose this time, uh, Caesar chose this time because of the decline in morale internally. That was part of it. The, the violence was evidence of a decline in morale. In other words, it wasn't just like, oh, we want violence. It was much more like a loss of faith in, you know, in keeping this up a whole other year because this was going into a whole other year. Uh, agriculture you know, works by seasons. And so this was like another grape season going to start. Oh, my God, and no work. And, and so there was that. Um, uh, there was also the need to call public attention back because we found every year we had to start the campaign all over again. I mean, every year we were having to restart because, you know, it would sort of end winter, okay, and then, you know, then people would forget and then we'd have to sort of reinitiate the whole thing. So that was, that was part of it. Um, I think part of it was the timing. I mean, you know, that year there was a lot going on, 1968. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there was uh, Vietnam, there was the elections, um, there was a the whole question of, uh, well, we turn turned about Bobby Kennedy and, and so forth. So there was a lot of other things going on in civil rights and in other movements around the country that sort of led him to pick that moment, which was before the Great Harvest began. Um, it, was, it was interesting timing. I mean, those were some of the factors. I don't know that there's a, a formula. But it's a great question. It's a really good thing to think about. Yeah? Also, in the case of uh, Gandhi, uh, because the, the nation was probably getting ready for a violent movement, which could have been a violent movement in 1930, yeah. he sort of preempted it with this movement. Yeah. I mean, that's a great observation, too. You know? It's like, it's always having to be out front, you know, a few steps. <laughs> You know, and you're thinking as much about your supporters as the opposition as other competitors. It's a very dynamic setting in which people are making these, these choices. But, you know, going back to Nada's point, I mean, you know, these choices were rarely made just by some individual going in a room and making the choice. You know, there were rich networks of people with whom everybody was working in these settings. And it's clearer in some than others. It's more mythical in some cases than others, the, you know, the stories that are told. But in reality, you don't find just like sort of one person who sort of is some just genius doing this by himself, including Gun. I mean, because uh, he was enmeshed in a whole network of Congress party people and the whole, whole thing there. What else on this? Yeah. 
this is probably pretty obvious, but just talking about tactics, like the being able to boycott grapes was something people could participate in, and I was really impressed just seeing how broad the movement extended and flying farm workers all over the country to go and speak in different cities and um, focusing strategically on bigger chains and being able to, I mean, I see a lot of the parallel today with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, and, but then sure. um, just like, it's a very simple thing that people can participate in. Did, did you get how, how we wound up doing grapes? I mean, why, I mean, I think this was in here, how we, we wound up actually having a great boycott at all, because we didn't intend to. No, we, we were organizing this one large, we'd gotten contracts in with wine uh, growing companies, because they had brands like Gallo and Palmason and so forth. But the big employers were in the table grapes and the fresh grapes, and there was one employer, Jamara, who was particularly huge. And we thought, well, we're going to target this guy and try to see what we can do with him. And um, we, you know, people came out on strike, and then we got in, they issued an injunction that sort of crippled our picketing operations. And so then we were stuck. And so, okay, well, let's try to boycott Jamara's grapes. That was the plan. And so, uh, so you know, we started following the trucks, you know, as they were leaving the, uh, it's the whole operation to sort of figure out where grapes are being sold and, and how they get there and all that. And, um, and trying to, you know, track, but when you go in a store, do you know what kind of grapes? I mean, uh, you know, well, let me see the box end, you know. Uh, and, but even so, we were still tracking that box end. We were, we were sort of looking in coolers and stores like in Chicago and go in the back and look in the cooler and see what the boxes were, whether we should pick at that store or not. But then something happened, the tomorrow labels began to disappear. And then all these other labels appeared. And it was all the other growers who were saying, oh, we're going we're gonna to take care of these guys. So that confronted us with the choice of either we let go of it or we just go after grapes, period. <laughs> That's what we did. And so later in 19, I mean, in, yeah, in, uh, in uh, 1970, when the whole industry broke, uh, they all blamed Jamara. <laughs> We should never believe you. We lent our labels to you. And so, because by that time, we were able to actually bring in the whole industry, 100,000 workers all over California, through that boycott, which we never would have gotten to had they not joined in helping Jamara try to frustrate us. So these things are always back and forth. You know, and sometimes something comes at you, and it seems like, like it's really kind of screw up your, your operating. But then that's when you got to go back and rethink it. Say, well, wait a second. Um, maybe there's another side to this whole thing. And that's, that's, uh, that's exactly what happened. So that's how we got. And a great boycott then turned out to be a whole lot easier than Jamara labels. I mean, who ever heard of that? But grapes, and then grapes of wrath, and grapes have all this wonderful symbolism of, you know, and cultural identity. And, you know, we had priests in supermarkets praying over the grapes. And all sorts of things were happening <laughs> with the grapes. I mean, it was, a, it was just a, it, it turned out to be uh, a wonderful target uh, to build a campaign around, like tea and like salt, something about consumables, you know, that, that, that makes this work. So, um, anyway, I, I mean, I hope it's useful to look at these kind of these mythic historical examples and see they're made out of exactly the same things you can do. It's in a different scale, in a different context, but the basic techniques, the basic <laughs> skills, the basic practices, it's the same stuff. Uh, it's just, you know, in a, in a different context and at a different scale. And what they all have in common is that they're all about empowering broad communities of people that didn't have power before. Uh, and, and that's why the tactics really, really matter. So let's, let's shift here and come back into the present. And, um, What are you going to do with your leadership team? Uh, we got uh, three weeks left here, a little less. How how are you going to provide leadership to your the people the, the, the people you've engaged or tried to engage up to now over this in this coming period? What what, what do you think that involves, or who's thought about that, or who's trying to deal with it, or trying to figure out something? 
Eric, I know you've been thinking about it. You yeah. want to, yeah. Um, well, so for the, I mean, we have our, our action on uh, April 26th, but then I have another leadership team meeting scheduled on May 5th. <coughs> on May 5th. Yeah. Right, so that we're intentionally kind of result of having a resolution on the campaign, but also how do we long term shape who we are and what we're going to continue to be. And I don't know, so I'm going to ask them. What are you going to ask? What they want the team to be and how they want it to be structured. And uh, you going to be there with them? I, yeah, certainly, absolutely. Yeah. I will be there. Yeah, we're, so we're launching the organization. Um, and it will be a changing dynamic of all of us having been volunteers and finding our own kind of self-interest and motivations to then, like, I, you know, I'm going to have a title and we'll have goals and we'll be a board and be different things. And how does that then change the dynamics? That'll be the interesting. Job? So you're really shifting into a new phase. Yeah, yeah. So it will be. Yeah, I don't. It'll be somewhat unpredictable, and I'm not sure. That, you know, it, it, it's yeah, it's gonna be a lot for us to navigate through in a very different way. So it, it, this is a case where it's moving into a whole other phase. But now, some of these uh, projects are ending. Um, some may continue. Some, it's not clear whether it's going to continue or not, or whether it's going to morph into a different form, perhaps. So, so how are you thinking about that? I mean, what, what are you thinking about in terms of how you're going to deal with your folks on that? You know, just not show up one day. I'll say, oh, oh, cost is over, bye. I mean, people you've been working with. Some are your fellow students, I don't know. But, yeah. Um, it's something I've been struggling with a lot because, for one, my project is more like power with. Yeah. Which we don't really talk about a lot yeah. in these files. So it's kind of a struggle to figure out how to work it. Two, I'm going to be graduating in the end of May. Um, and three, I'm mostly working with folks out in Boston, so I'm working with black-owned businesses. Yeah. Um, and have their own time constraints. So the big struggle for me is just trying to figure out, because we actually have like sort of titles kind of already, and some of the people involved are students, and some of the people involved are, are, are businesses, and just trying to figure out sort of what's next. And we've all been operating under the assumption that this is something that is going to continue. Yeah. And that's something that's valuable, uh, because of bringing power together to do something that should be sustainable. but. Uh, I'm just worried about like how it's going to be facilitated in the future with like me and I there, yeah. uh, with the students leaving for the summer, um, and with a lot of the businesses just have like a lot of time constraints where they can't necessarily take a super super active role in terms of like facilitating, you know, doing logistical stuff. Uh, so that's the struggle. Does right? everybody know what this project is? You want to just say a couple sentences? Uh, so uh, I'm basically working with. Uh, Students, um, professionals, and black-owned uh, businesses in Boston to create a black a coalition of black-owned businesses uh, around the city uh, so for the purposes of one, um, supporting each other through sharing resources and sort of finding resources in the city, and two, building better relationships with uh, black opinion groups at different universities. So, uh, anybody got advice for them? Questions? I mean, come on, it's an exciting time. It's reaching. Come on. What would? Help them out. They can partner my organization. Oh, all right, okay, all right, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, Eric and then Jeff, yeah. I guess, Julian, one thing I heard was it sounds like you might, you might be a little worried how the organization can continue without you. And I, I guess I wonder if you can imagine, like, what, what, I don't know, if you can imagine what that would look like, like, who, who is, I've thought about it, but that's part of the concern because I don't know if we have enough people. Like we have like three or four businesses that are really like involved. Yeah. But in terms of like facilitating, like I don't, I'm not seeing that. Which is the, which is. Have you asked for that? Um. Not directly. That might help. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's a good. Uh, it might be useful information. No, it's hard. It's like, it's also, you know, you, you find yourself in a situation where things are actually working, and then, oh, wait a second. Uh, well, if I'm gone, everything's going to collapse, right? Well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe it matters enough to the people you've been organizing that they're going to want to keep it going, you know, which would be pretty cool. But it's hard to find that out unless you find it out. 
I mean, it's sort of, yes, yeah, Sharanya? And there are small things like uh, when you go away, you're the one who probably was emailing everyone, telling everyone to come here and there. So while they might have the passion to continue, they might just not because nobody knows who's going to email who and they might just wait it out. So try and look for people who want these roles already. Are you going to be the one who's going to communicate? Are you going to be the one who's going to uh, organize the meetings and facilitate the meetings? Once you assign these roles, then you know what their next step is. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's good too. It makes it less scary and more concrete. You can think in terms of specific steps. I mean, there is a, there is a sort of come to Jesus dimension of this, I mean, so to speak, right? I mean, by that I mean, you know, sort of like, um, you know, a moment of choice. Uh, like, are we going to do this or not? Are we going to take it on or not? And that, that has to come. That, I mean, that has to come uh, because it is. It's a conscious choice. Yeah, we'll, yes, we'll own it. No, we won't. Now, the, the concrete, the steps and so forth make the whole thing a lot more plausible and a lot more imaginable and less scary and all the rest of it. I think that's a good point. But I mean, it's, um, you know, it, it's in a way, it's a good problem. I mean, because you've got some folks that are really engaged in something of real value. And so now the question is, can they, what can they take and do with it? There was over, yeah. Um, is there an example of someone here, I, I, I wonder maybe the fellows, um, that they have d dealt with a problem like that, that they, not a problem, but that issue that uh, they were the ones that, that started the organization and that step, I think art might be the one that dealt with that, I don't know, being far away from, from where you are, uh, but I don't know if you're totally now disconnected, for example, uh, <coughs> people that are gonna go away from the school and have started something here, but are totally going to be disconnected from the project? How, or, or do you still have a link to that, or what has happened? And are they still working completely? Yeah, no, I mean, I can take a stab at that. So, I mean, certainly, I think coming away from, like, campaigns that I had worked really hard to build was really, really tough. Uh, and I think, like, for me, it was had to be a really intentional process of, like, how do I work with the, with the people that I've been working with to lead this the whole time, but it wasn't me, and how do I ultimately work to make the role that I had obsolete? Like, how do I really build the capacity to allow this to keep going? And do I still keep in touch with folks and like, you know, help kind of troubleshoot and strategy stuff? Definitely, like when, you know, as needed, but I'm not leading that, it's not mine, right? It's something that I was helping work with people to build but then people took leadership and kept things going. And I think like it's a tough balance because I felt, I mean, for me it was like a baby, right? Mm -hmm. It was like I worked so hard building up some of these things back home, but that's really tough, but it's also really important to give the reins to the folks that I was working with to build it in the first place. Arjun, you had no. Yeah, <clears throat> I was thinking about, um, I've been thinking about this transition of leadership thing as well a lot, um, working with students and you know, one of the things that has always has helped is thinking about picking people in, in different years and you know, in particular I was working with medical students so it's like four different years and everyone's sort of in a different maturity and clinical experience and so it's, it's nice to have a mentorship between years yeah. um, and then kind of people graduating from <coughs> the roles but then after what you just said R2 about making your role obsolete it made me think about um, my leadership structure and whether it's fixed or if it's fluid in the sense that um, am I looking for a successor to myself or am I looking for a group of people who might organize themselves slightly differently and rather than just you know tapping the next person and say you take my role you take that person's role and so on key thing is that people will take the responsibility yeah I mean that's 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 really the key thing Jeff you had to what we found in our small business association was that particularly with small businesses being resource constrained, um, I think the word was, how do you get them out of the foxholes, you know? They're so intent on generating sales and staying in, in economic success. Um, that has to be a strong draw for them. Maybe the affiliation component is strong enough, uh, but there might be something more that the other folks in the group can bring to those small businesses that would be useful for their sales or profitability or what have you. That's interesting too, and certainly something to explore. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, just kind of building off what I said, I, I've had to leave a few uh, campaigns that I felt like were also my baby. And uh, I think uh, something that I learned from that experience is, is that a good organizer organizes themselves out of a job, you know? And that was something that I had to learn um, because at, at one point I started getting concerned that no one wanted to take responsibility. Um, but it was hard for me to, I think, reflect on how much uh, sort of space I was taking up as a leader within that space. So, in other words, if things are getting handled, then who, why would somebody try to handle it, right? Like it's getting done. And so it, I had to create some uncertainty in, in the sense that uh, this is, I'm not gonna do this anymore, so who will? Um, and start inching out that way, and then people were like, oh, some, oh, I can, I can create? Oh, okay, I'll do this, and then, oh, I'll do that. And then so, then you start to see people's eyes light up because there, there's space for them to do work, versus when you're so engaged, there's no space for them to move, so why would they? It also requires confronting the truth that you, in fact, might be replaceable. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, no, I mean, there's a lot of stuff involved here, really. It's, it's not, yeah, Dimitri? Yes, I have always defined success as in succession. So therefore, uh, I would start the meeting by telling them that, look, whatever I do, whatever my success is, is if this organization moves forward without me. And therefore, when they're recruiting and they're telling their story, it would have to be in the sense that their success can only be defined within the organizational concept by them finding someone to hand over to as well. Mm -hmm. So we take that through as a story through the motivation process and that. Therefore, it's from the beginning, I am not going to be here from me. Yeah. Therefore, the success depends on what happens when I leave. Yeah. No, and it's going to, because you've been building an interesting group there. And it's going to be very, everybody know what Dimitri's project? I'm going to just say what your project okay. just, yeah. Right, I'm trying to get, um, not trying to, I am getting. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> African students, um, Harvard, MIT to begin to think of taking part in the process back home instead of staying in after the education. And in doing so, I've also, and I haven't told Art, set up, <laughs> set up, organized a counterpart organization back home to work with them. Oh, that's cool. When, when I leave, so. Cool. And I had a meeting with them this weekend as well. That's great. Uh, no, it's terrific, that's good, yeah. Yeah, we don't need to know about it. <laughs> no, no, but look, and then it may also be that um, that the project ends, right? And that it, it you know, it, it existed, it made a contribution, you learned, other people learned, some people gained from it, and, and it's over. And that's fine too. It's like there's no, you know, um, there's no one, you know, that, um, gee, unless it lasts for a thousand years, she's, you know, I really screwed up. Not at all. And, and maybe the project didn't work. What do you do with that case? There's nobody to pass it on to. It didn't work. Well, hopefully you're going to take some valuable lessons. I mean, it's, it's really trying to think now about how to, the value here, and the value you're going to take from this whole experience, whether it's in the form of a leadership team that's going to continue this work, whether it's a project that ends, or whether it, it was a, a challenging, perhaps even painful, but perhaps uh, really helpful learning experience. I mean, it's, it's not the same for everybody. And, you know, so, and the test ultimately, from the standpoint of a class, is, is what value it serves in terms of your own learning. Because, you know, people are going to go out in the world and do all kinds of things. And hopefully this experience can contribute to that. So, you know, yeah, but I mean, but thinking about how you draw it to a conclusion or the next step is very important. And there isn't a lot of time for this because you want to do it with grace and you want to do it thoughtfully and proactively and that's kind of why we, why we wanted to put it on the agenda to be thinking about. Uh, the, uh, the second thing, some of you have events coming up, I think, right? I think there's some events planned. How are you thinking about uh, make, oh geez, I didn't know the time. <laughs> uh, what are you paying attention to in terms of making those events work, if that's, a, if that's the best way to phrase that? I mean, you know, because you've been um, doing stuff, there's an event coming, uh, was it going to happen, wasn't, uh, no, there's a lot of stuff with leadership teams. Now, just focusing on that event, what are you focusing on to make that event as worth as much as you can? What, what sort of considerations? 
I know you got events coming, you know? Some people have had events and so forth. What, what are you thinking about? Yeah. How to stay in the budget. How to, how to stay in the budget, all right. Yeah, it's good, all right. And, um, good, you have a budget, I'm just kidding. How to be completely sure that these people are going to turn up. So while we have commitments coming, how to still be sure that they will come. So how can you be really sure they're going to come? I don't know, this is the number one question on an event. No, no, it is the number one question because there's no event, no, no people, no event. So how can you be really sure they come? Yeah. I just, yeah, on that, I've just been, everything that's been ringing my ear about turnout comes out of the hour before the event. So <laughs> it's not like just wait until then. It's like, like what all goes into then on that final hour, and I'm talking about as a team, that we can send that text message and make that phone call, and that we have the relationship with the people. Yeah. So the hour before the event, they're not like, who is this, right? They're like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, 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 what has that, that last yeah. hour? What else? Yeah, another? Yeah, just going off that point, in section last week, we talked about the importance of just creating an environment in which people, like, really don't want to miss this. Like, they feel like they'll be missing out of something. It's not just a matter of, like, you know, contacting them once, but maybe thinking strategically about, like, their networks and who are the people that you want to pull in and who are the other folks that kind of have some degree of influence. And, you know, just thinking strategically about, like, who, who, who you know, who do you really want there to make the most of whatever you're trying to do? Okay, and what else? Yeah. Um, thanks. The thing that I'm focusing on with my event is um, making sure that it's, so we're, we've decided to focus on building a community that doesn't currently exist, but then it's more than that, it's trying to see what the takeaway will be and getting commitments from the people who come, and uh, that is their first connection with this group of people. Yeah. Um, so like creating a nurturing environment, but also getting a hard commitment, either there or, or later. Yeah, and so having an event in which nobody commits to anything, and no, yeah, that's a problem. I mean, so it's, there's, there's a whole role of commitment in getting people there, and then there's the whole role of what happens there in terms of the value it has afterwards, and whether people are called upon to commit to something, to make a choice of some kind, actually act, get names, all the rest of that stuff. And, and the beforehand, there's a big difference between advertising an event and mobilizing commitments to come to an event, at, at night and day. Uh, and all the advertising in the world is no compensation for uh, uh, getting 50 people who commit to come because you ask them for that commitment, you put it down, and then when you do that reminder call, then it actually means something because you got the commitment. And so the more that it's focused there, the more uh, the more productive your event is likely to be. Now, all this stuff comes down to real all the details. This is when the details really really matter, uh, and and you know really following through on each thing. There was yeah. Oh, I was just going to add. I'm actually less concerned about getting people there and more concerned that the people who come will get more out of the event and will get out of bringing them into the fold, and Good. that's what I'm concerned about. Well, it sounds like you're thinking about how to trap that, though. I mean, I don't mean what, I mean, but you know, how to, how to trap the commitment for the future. That's kind of the, the one that you have. Julian, you were going to? Um, sort of in terms of like the lead up, uh, one of the things I'm trying to do in terms of trying to get people to actually come is, um, is related to like capacity building, like having people um, do things like this week that will sort of put them in a position where they kind of have to come. Um, so like people have a certain role there. So there's yeah. a, a thing that they're good. supposed to do, like a draft of uh, something for, I think, um, for Friday. And then there's um, you know a logo that someone's supposed to be making, so, and, and they're supposed to be responsible for actually bringing like, the little things. So those sorts of things, I mean, it's not going to capture 50 people. But you know, there are about you know, seven people who have these sorts of things, where if they, if they do that, my hope then is that you know the hour before when I follow up, they'll be more inclined to come yeah. than the other folks. Uh, yeah, the, the powerful logic of the potluck, you know. Uh, if you don't show up, there's not going to be any salad for everybody, you know. And so it's kind of like, no, I mean, it's, it is that thing about sharing responsibility and, and, and letting people know we're saving a seat just for you. We have it, you know, right here. Uh, but that is when all the all the, the, the details really really do matter. I mean, they matter like like uh, making sure there's a, a plug for the sound system. I mean, uh, yeah, so many stories can be told about the you know the 2,000 people that show up for the political rally, and guess what? Uh, the, nobody's got the electrical cord. And, uh, it's just anyway. Uh, just the last thing I want to mention is about. Um, it says more you can talk about on events, is thinking about what's next after that, not just in terms of leadership team, but uh, you need to celebrate what you did with your people, uh, whether successful or not, in whatever terms you're evaluating that. 
Remember we talked about you know, celebrating losses while well, instead of celebrating. It's, it's really important to find a way with the people you're working with to take the time and honor what you've been doing. And, and it's worth it. And it's important to also think about that uh, and how you're going to do that as well as the kind of evaluation and follow-up that you'll want to do afterwards. So it's thinking about you know, that team, it's thinking about the event, and then it's thinking about what comes after the event. And that's kind of where our energy is sort of shifting now. So um, last, what are some takeaways from today? Takeaways from today. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Find sources of resilience. You see that run through all these stories that we that we read. Yeah, okay. uh, reinforcing that nonviolence is action and it's active and engagement, but it's not passive. Yeah, nonviolence is a terrible name for nonviolence. Uh, <laughs> Satyagraha is better. Truth force, soul force, truth force. It's a it's a form of it's a it's a proactive, positive. It was like we always were taught that if people are standing there to do, it's not doing nothing. It's acting, but in a, in a different way. And I think that's really important to get about nonviolence. It's not nonviolence. Yeah. And, and building off that, just the universality of it, through history, through time, it's just needs to reflect on it. See that in the small little things we're doing, how it actually is. Yeah. actually is amazing big thing. No, that's cool. I hope you take that. Yeah, it's good. I think again, like They should be grateful, damn it. <laughs> like Gandhi makes those guys sing in the, in the, in the movie. Yeah, yeah. What else? How did you take away? Yeah. I really like how um, you sort of summarized the two pieces of this week by the simplicity of the action, like taking it down to some um, a tangible issue that impacts the world. Hiding in plain view. Hiding in plain view. Yeah, that happens too much. What else? What do you think of Scott? I think also for me, considering the American Revolution as an organizing project. <laughs> <laughs> Good. One thing that, that sort of struck me, because I thought about it in a historical context, and I thought about it in the context of my project, but kind of bringing that together, um, really forging and creating a new consciousness and identity, because they didn't think of themselves as Americans, and how much of that, how much that was a part of their project that actually That's great. was underrated. Uh, that's good. Uh, that's a very good perspective on it. Okay, well, have a good week. And uh, see you Thursday.